Good morning. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Office of Human Resources and President Hanlon. It's wonderful to see so many of you here as we rise together to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I hope that you've been enjoying the great food provided by the Hanover Inn and that you have, are having the chance to meet some new colleagues from across the campus. This year marks the 13th year that we have provided this breakfast as an opportunity for staff and faculty to come together to recognize the work and legacy of Dr. King and also to contemplate and reflect on Dartmouth's commitment to diversity and inclusion and what we can all do within our own roles at Dartmouth to appreciate difference and make our workplaces and our community welcoming to all. Before I introduce today's feature speaker, Matt Delmont, I am delighted to introduce Evelyn Ellis, who is the Vice President for Institutional Diversity and Equity at Dartmouth College, who will perform This Is My Song. Please join me in welcoming Evelyn L Ellis, and accompanying her on piano is Selena Noor, Dartmouth College student, class of 2022. The song's lyrics will be presented on the screen behind me. Evelyn? Good morning. Good morning. I switched the song on you. <laughs> but, uh, we're not doing the anthem, so you don't have to stand the third verse, but you definitely have to sing with me. Welcome, Selena. This is her first visit here. And I chose this song because of the words. And as I'm singing it, as I'll try to enunciate as best I can, but the words will be up there. And then the third verse, you will get to sing with me. My country's going 
As many of you know, we like to have a member of the Dartmouth community as a guest speaker. This year, we have a newer member of our community. Matt Delmont is a Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor of History. Born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, he earned his BA from Harvard University and worked in management consulting and marketing before earning his MA and PhD from Brown University. Prior to joining the Dartmouth faculty in January 2019, he taught at Scripps College in Claremont, California for six years and at Arizona State University for four years. At Arizona State University, he served as the director of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, leading an interdisciplinary unit with over 80 faculty, 200 graduate students, and more than 1,300 undergraduate majors. His research focuses on US history, African American history, and the history of civil rights. He is the author of four books, The Nicest Kids in Town, American Bandstand, Rock and Roll, and the Struggle for Civil Rights in 1950s Philadelphia, Why Busing Failed, Race Media, and the National Resistance to School Desegregation, Making Roots, A Nation Captivated, and Black Quotidian, Everyday History in African American Newspapers. I had to look up that word, Quotidian. He has created companion websites to extend and enhance each of these books, and you can find links to these websites on the Dartmouth faculty page. In addition to these books and digital projects, he has published more than a dozen academic journal articles and has shared his research with popular audiences through articles, op-eds, and interviews in the New York Times, NPR, Washington Post, the Atlantic Slate, and other popular venues. He's currently working on a new book titled Half American, African Americans Fighting World War II at Home and Abroad, for which he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. The project is under contract with Viking Books, and the anticipated publication date is 2022. Please join me in welcoming today's guest speaker, Matt Delmont. Thank you, Scott, for that nice introduction, and thank you, Evelyn, for the beautiful song to get us started. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to spend time with all of you this morning on this important day. As many of you know, this is the 35th year we'll be celebrating the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That means that almost all of our students and recent alumni have never known a time when schools and communities did not take the third Monday in January to reflect on the life and legacy of this important civil rights leader. One measure of how successful the holiday has been can be found in a study that two Stanford historians conducted over a decade ago. They asked 2,000 high school students whom they considered to be a famous American, excluding presidents. The top response, named by two-thirds of students, was Martin Luther King, Jr. I hear this in the classroom all the time when I teach about American history and the history of civil rights. I'll mention King, and the students will assure me they've already covered him in high school, junior high, or even elementary school. So, they say, Professor Delma, we know that already. They'll roll their eyes and be bored with it. This presents an interesting challenge. While I'm thrilled that King is one of the most recognized figures in American history, I worry that when many people think of him, they only think of a few famous quotations. Consider, for example, King's speech at the 1963 March on Washington. I Have a Dream is one of the most famous speeches in American history. In the speech's most well-known part, King said his dream is a, deem, a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. He continued, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they'll be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now this is a remarkable speech, don't get me wrong, but in the decades since King spoke these words, people with goals very different from King's have taken the sentiment to judge not by the color of one's skin, but by the content of one's character, to argue that public policies, laws, institutions should not pay attention to racial identities, and instead, to advocate for colorblind, colorblind policies that often entrench racial inequality. This requires a willful misreading of King's speech and of the March on Washington. The section of King's speech I just quoted is a small part of a much longer speech. This full speech, which you can find online, is nearly 18 minutes long in King's very deliberate speaking style. If you read or listen to the speech, you'll hear King say that the marchers have come to dramatize the shameful, shameful condition and that black Americans are treated as exiles in their own land. He said, we can never be satisfied as long as African Americans are the victims of unspeakable horrors of police brutality, 
and that we cannot be satisfied as long as black people in Mississippi cannot vote and black people in New York believe they have nothing for which to vote. The event itself was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And marchers carried signs demanding better housing, education, and health care, not colorblindness. The larger problem, though, is that when we honor King, there's a temptation to focus only on the most familiar and comforting parts of his life. If we focus only on his most well-known sound bites, we end up with a very distorted understanding of his life and the larger goals of the civil rights movement. This morning, I'd like to offer two solutions to this problem. The first is to remember how this holiday came to be. So I mentioned this is the 35th year we've had this as a federal holiday. I, think I really want us to think about what it means that we have the holiday in front of us. We need to remember that King was a very controversial figure and that to many Americans, honoring him with the national holiday was an outrageous idea. After 35 years, it would be easy to take the holiday for granted. But if we remember how people worked to make this day a reality, we'll be better able to honor King's legacy. So we are here this morning because of the work of Coretta Scott King who led the fight for the King holiday for over two decades. Born in 1927 in Marion, Alabama, Coretta Scott excelled academically and musically as a child. She graduated valedictorian from the segregated Lincoln High School, where she played trumpet, piano, and sang in the chorus. Growing up in Alabama, Coretta witnessed racial violence on numerous occasions, and as a teenager, her family's home and father's sawmill were burned down by white vigilantes. She attended Antioch College in Ohio, where she became politically active in the campus NAACP, Civil Liberties Com Committee, and pacifist groups. She earned a scholarship to New England Conservatory of Music, and it was in Boston in 1952 that she met Martha King Jr. They were married in June of 1953 on the lawn of Coretta's mother's home, and the ceremony is performed by Martin's father. She insisted that the word obey be removed from their wedding vows. <laughs> as Martin ascended as a pastor and civil rights leader in the 1950s, Coretta played an important role. She's sometimes referred to as the First Lady of Civil Rights, but she's much, much more than that. When the King's house was bombed during the Montgomery bus boycott, Coretta was home with their 10-week-old daughter, Yolanda. Her father and Martin's father encouraged them to leave, but she refused to flee. She said, during the bus boycott, I was tested by fire, and I came to understand that I was not a breakable crystal figurine. I found it became stronger in a crisis. The boycott lasted over a year, and the King's phone rang constantly with threatening calls. Coretta had a sense of humor, and she greeted these hate calls with sort of this grim sense of humor, sometimes responding, my husband is asleep. He told me to write the name and number of anyone who called to threaten his life so that he could return the call and receive it fresh in the morning when he wakes up. <laughs> Throughout the 1950s and 60s, Coretta advocated for peace in both domestic and international contexts, pushing Martin to become more vocal on global human rights. In 1965, she was the only woman to speak at an anti-war rally in New York's Madison Square Garden, two years before Martin's sermon against the war in Vietnam. When a reporter asked Martin if he had briefed credit on the issue, Martin replied, no, she educated me. In the 15 years they were married, Martin received hundreds of death threats, and Credo lived with the constant fear that she and their children would one day lose him. That day arrived on April 4, 1968, when Martin was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee. In the days that followed, Credit tra traveled from Atlanta to Memphis to retrieve her husband's body, back to Atlanta to make preparations for the visitations, back to Memphis to lead the march that Martin had planned, and then back to Atlanta for the funeral, all while caring for four children, of whom she was now a single mother. And for some context, it's 400 miles between Atlanta and Memphis, uh, longer than the distance between here, Hanover, and Philadelphia. Now just think about that. Think about how much courage and resolve it took for Coretta Scott King to return to Memphis after her husband's assassination, to lead thousands of people in a march to support sanitation workers. So that's what Martin Luther King was doing in Memphis at the time he was assassinated. He was leading a march of sanitation workers and garbage men uh, to demand economic rights. She told the crowd, Martin often said, unearned suffering is redemptive. And if you give your life to a cause in which you believe and which is right and just, and if your life comes to an end as a result of this, then your life could not have been lived in a more redemptive way. And I think this is what my husband has done. But then I ask, how many men must die before we can really have a true and free and peaceful society? How long will it take? If we can catch the spirit and the true meaning of this experience, I believe that this nation can be transformed into a society of love, of justice and peace and brotherhood, where we can all really be brothers. That same day, just four days after King's death, Representative John Conyers introduced the first bill for a federal holiday in King's honor, 
So this fight had been going on that long, just four days after King was assassinated, people were already fighting for the King holiday. In the weeks, months, and years that followed, Credit Scott King led this fight for the King holiday. The progress was slow, excruciatingly slow. In the early 1970s, supporters gathered petitions with millions of names in support of the King holiday, but Congress was reluctant to act. In 1975, four states, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Connecticut, established state holidays honoring King. Coretta wrote city council members, mayors, and governors across the country, urging them to pass resolutions and organize programs to celebrate Martin's birthday. She testified before Congress, gave speeches, made phone calls, and basically cajoled anyone she thought she, who could help. She organized a coalition of 750 political, religious, labor, and civil rights groups to help lobby Congress on the King holiday. Musician C.B. Wonder assisted by recording a song in support of the holiday, also on YouTube, uh, and funding an office and small staff in Washington, D.C. to aid the lobbying effort. Finally, in August of 1983, the House of Representatives and Senate approved the King holiday bill. With Coretta looking on, President Reagan signed legislation into law in November of 1983. Of course, national holidays are only legal holidays for federal employees. So over the next two years, Coretta visited all 50 states to encourage them to honor the national holiday and to create some uniformity in how it was celebrated across the country. On January 20th, 1986, nearly 20 years after Coretta started her campaign, Martin Luther King Day was celebrated nationally for the first time. Several states, however, refused to celebrate King Day. In Arizona, voters initially turned down the holiday and lost a chance to host the Super Bowl before subsequently voting in favor of the holiday in 1992. New Hampshire, as many of you likely know, was one of the last states to approve the holiday. Lawmakers voted down bills honoring King in the late 1980s. In 1991, they approved an optional Civil Rights Day, but made no mention of King in the holiday's title. Finally, after extensive organizing by local civil rights advocates, lawmakers, sorry, by local civil rights advocates, lawmakers approved the King holiday in 1999. And it was officially celebrated in the Granite State for the first time in just 2000. Now, I've only lived in New Hampshire for a short time, just a year and a half. Uh, in some ways, I'm actually glad that the state was one of the last to approve the King holiday, because it can help us to ensure that we don't take the holiday for granted. When we gather on this third Monday each January, we should thank Credit Scott King and the local organizers who fought to make this holiday a reality. The second thing I would urge us to do today is to spend time reading or listening to Martin Luther King's words. Not just the brief sound bites, like the portion of the I Have a Dream speech I quoted earlier, but his longer speeches, essays, and sermons. The majority, of these are the majority of these are available online or from our library, and I'll mention just a few here. You can consider this your homework assignment. <laughs> you might start with Stride Toward Freedom, King's 1958 memoir of the Montgomery bus boycott. Published when King was just 29 years old, Stride Toward Freedom established King as a leading national figure in the civil rights movement. Importantly, though, the bus boycott was much larger than King. Over 40,000 African Americans boycotted the segregated public transit system in Montgomery for 381 days. And again, think about that. The amount of people it took and amount of resolve it took to not use public transit, not use buses, for 381 days over a year to walk to work, to get carpools to work. Um, and the work was led largely by black women. And I think that's important to not leave out of the King holiday. I think we can focus sometimes too much on Martin Luther King and not enough on the uh, central role African American women played in moving the civil rights movement. Eventually, they were successful in integrating the bus system in, in Montgomery. You could revisit King's famous letter from Birmingham jail, written in response to white religious leaders who described uh, the Birmingham civil rights movement as unwise and untimely. This essay will remind you that many Americans considered even the moderate, nonviolent civil rights protests that King led to be too much too soon. King described a sense of urgency that made it impossible for African Americans to wait for equality. He wrote, for years now, I've heard the words wait. It rings in the ear of every black American with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. He continued, I guess it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging facts of segregation to say wait. But when you've seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your brothers and sisters at whim, when you've seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million black brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, then you'll understand why we find it difficult to wait. Now, if, like me, you have children or nieces and nephews, King's letter from Birmingham jail can help explain what racism and white supremacy looked like to young people. 
King describes being tongue twisted, trying to explain to his six year old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that was advertised on television. Tears welled up in his daughter's eyes when he told her that Funtown, that was the name of the amusement park, that Funtown is closed to black children. Now being able to visit an amusement park, skating rink, or swimming pool might seem insignificant, but these were the places where children often learned about America's system of Jim Crow apartheid segregation. You can also explain that children were active participants in the civil rights movement in Birmingham and elsewhere. Thousands of children participated in the nonviolent children's crusade in Birmingham in 1963, some as young as six years old. Police sprayed the children with water hoses, hit them with batons, and threatened them with police dogs. Hundreds of children were arrested and spent several days in jail, but the protests ultimately drew national attention to the civil rights struggle. If you want a better idea of why many people opposed the King holiday, why he was such a controversial figure at the end of his life, listen to the speech he delivered at New York's Riverside Church in 1967 called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. Like Coretta Scott King a couple years earlier, Martin spoke out against the war in Vietnam. He said, we've been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching black and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together at the same schools. So we watched them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of poor villages, but we realized that they could hardly live together in the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. I knew I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without her having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. This was an extremely controversial opinion for Martin Luther King to have in 1967. A Gallup poll found that three quarters of white Americans had an unfavorable view of King at the end of his life, and major newspapers and, and magazines editorialized against him. In his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here?, King expanded on his opposition to the war and how the money being spent on Vietnam could be better spent fighting poverty in America. Where Do We Go From Here? outlined King's thinking on economic rights and was the springboard for launching the Poor People's Campaign. In this campaign, which dominated the last year of King's life, he worked to bring together blacks, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and whites to fight to secure economic justice for the poor. As with his anti-war views, major newspapers argued that King's emphasis on poverty was divisive, and the FBI tried to disrupt the poor people's campaign because they believed King was a communist. Finally, you could read a sermon King delivered at his home church, Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist, in February of 1968, two months before he was killed. In the sermon, titled Drum Major Instinct, King warned that the materialism of modern American society led many people to try to surpass each other by purchasing the fanciest, ca fanciest cars or the largest houses. He saw a nation of unchecked egos in which everyone wanted to be the drum major leading the parade. In turn, he saw this desire to feel superior fueling racial and economic inequality. Instead of feeding their own egos, King asked his audience to think of Jesus and the lesson that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. King said, by giving that definition of greatness, everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato or Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need to have a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. Now, if you spend time with King's words, you'll quickly remember he was a religious leader, not a politician. He did not think strictly in terms of election cycles, political parties, or voting blocks. For him, the stakes were much higher than that. When he preached on the drum major instinct, King knew he was not long for this world. He spoke about how he wanted to be remembered. And so I'd like to conclude with his conclusion from that sermon. He said, if you are around when I've met my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or 400 other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to say that day that I tried to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I tried in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say I was a drum major, say I was a drum major for justice. 
Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all those other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Matt, thank you for those insightful remarks. Before we close, I'd like to recognize the work of many that have contributed to this morning's event. Please help me thank the Hanover Inn staff, Media Production Group, and Human Resources. <laughs> Additionally, I'd like to give special thanks to Evelyn Ellis and Selena Knorr for sharing their musical talents. and to Institutional Diversity and Equity and Conference and Special Events for their leadership in arranging an amazing program of events to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King. So I encourage each of you to look online. There's a website right up here to view the many inspiring events that will be taking place over the next few weeks. And with that, I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. Have a great day. <laughs>